All right, guys. Good stuff. All right, guys, let's grab our Bibles. First Kings chapter 12. First Kings 12. Let's, uh, hey, bro. Love you, man. Let's keep, uh, if you can, keep Lynn Massey in your prayers. She's in, she uh, went to Japan. I don't know if you got the prayer alerts, but uh, she went to Japan, and when she got there, she heard news that her brother passed away. So she is working the text and the phones while she's over in uh, Japan right now. And so just keep her in prayer and the family in prayer. And he's a believer. He's with the Lord. But just uh, keep her in prayer and, uh, uh, and uh, remember her right now. So let's pray. Dear Father, we just come before you and we just thank you so much for this body. Lord, we thank you for your grace towards us. You, Lord, in the center of this church. And Father, we just, uh, before we even begin, we just want to lift up Lynn into your hands that you just bless her. Take care of her, Lord. Just take her through this time of just uh, grief and uh, just in an in a awkward place, an awkward situation as she travels home. And uh, just be with her, Lord, and just take care of the family. And uh, we just thank you for her and her service at this uh, church for so many years. And so, Lord, tonight, as we open your word, we ask that you would just be pleased by what you see and by what you hear. And, the Lord, that we would be pleased by your word. Feed us. Grow us. We just want to uh, know you more, Lord. So bless this time in Jesus' name. Amen. So we, we've got through the week, the break, yeah, I call it the Easter pause, you know, and just like, good grief, what did we study last time? First Kings chapter 11 was a great chapter. We saw the kind of like the end, end time of Solomon, and it was a kind of a drag. It was a, just a disappointment. He did not finish well. He got caught up with too many wives, too many concubines that swayed his heart to go after uh, these false gods, and he worshiped them, and he built altars into them, and he appeased these, um, these marriages of convenience. And so it was a real drag, and then he just, uh, his heart was swayed by them, according to what the scripture says, and, uh, and God did something through the uh, prophet. Uh, the prophet came to him and says, because you sinned, and he was warned, he was warned, because you've sinned, and your heart's been turned. I'm going to tear from you, or it just was very clear. He really didn't say it to Solomon. It said it to this guy named Jeroboam. Jeroboam was one of his workers, one of his head guys that was in charge of the, uh, he was really the foreman of the construction job in Jerusalem. And he says, Jeroboam, I'm going to make, I'm going to give you 10 of the tribes of, the, of Israel. And Solomon will have the one, Judah. And I'm going to rip it from his hands, tear it out of his hands, give it to you. And Jeroboam was like, oh, well, Jer and he also told Jeroboam, he said, hey, Jerry, uh, we could, we, it could be better for you. We, I, I will start something new in you if you just follow my, my word and obey my commands. And, and well, Jeroboam is not going to do that. He's going to do it his way. And we're going to see that beginning in this study tonight. Well, when Solomon hears about that, Solomon goes after Jeroboam. Jeroboam takes off, of course, and runs to Egypt. And he's in hiding under the Pharaoh there in Egypt. And Jeroboam is there. Solomon continues. And of course, we see in the end of chapter 11, 1 Kings, that Solomon dies. And uh, his son, Rehoboam, takes over. Uh, this is not the end of our study of Solomon. We're going to continue to study him when we hit 2 Chronicles, the book of Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and uh, Song of Solomon. So there's a lot more of Solomon left in our study throughout his whole life, the good and the bad, the, uh, the, the, the end years and, and, the, and the good years, the wisdom years and the foolish years. Uh, there's a lot more of Solomon that we're going to be getting into as the years progress. But um, his son, the only son we know of, Rehoboam, 
Out of all those ladies, <laughs> all those wives, we only know one son, and, and we know that it, there was the, an Egyptian uh, woman. There was an Egyptian woman that is mentioned constantly that he married the, the daughter of Pharaoh, and he built a palace for her. Uh, it, it, she was kind of like the ringleader of his paganism, if you look at the scriptures. But then, uh, of course, there's also the Shulamite woman that's mentioned in Song of Solomon. Uh, that, that, it, we don't even know if she's real, though. It might be a poem. Uh, it was just like a, a woman from Jerusalem, a local girl, you know? Uh, and that was a very passionate, uh, yeah, I believe it was a real woman. Uh, but he was a very passionate love affair that he has with this wife of his, this, the local girl. And then uh, we have this other woman. Uh, her name was Naama, an Ammonite, a pagan, probably. Uh, but remember, Naha, uh, this woman, uh, Nahama, the Ammonite, uh, hey, it, she means pleasant. That name means pleasant one. Uh, it's where we get the word Naomi from. Same, same name phraseology. And that's the mother of Rehoboam, the next king of Judah, or really the next king of Israel, but he's going to lose it. And so we pick it up with his coronation in chapter 12, verse 1, the next king. And Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel had gone to Shechem to make him king. Now, you, the first thing that pops up, did you catch that? Where are they going? Shechem. Where's Jerusalem? Why are they going to Shechem? Where is Shechem? Shechem is up in the north. It's up in the tribe of Ephraim. It's Israel. It's really the unofficial capital of Israel, the ten tribes of the north. Kind of like California, our capital is Sacramento, but the capital of the Southland is, is L.A. You know, it's like when, when you think of South L.A. or South California, Southern California, you think of Los Angeles. You don't think of San Diego or, or anything like, come on, you know. And, you know and that's funny when everybody talks about that. You go, you know, where are you from? Oh, Southern California. Oh, okay, what part? San Diego. You're like, well, yeah, okay. You know? <laughs> I never, no, all of us, I have never thought of that as, you know, when someone says Southern California, it's like, oh, San Diego. Oh, that's San Diego. That's not Southern California. It's kind of weird, you know, if you ever thought about that. I know some people disagree, but it just is there in our thing. So here with the, the, the tribes of Israel, it, it was the unofficial, it was not the capital of the country. It was just this northern spot that was the seat of authority in northern Israel. Why is he going up there to be coordinated, uh, to be crowned? He's going up there because... It's a political move. We know for a long time that the, tri the 10 tribes of Israel, the tribes of the north, also known as the tribes of Ephraim. Ephraim was the most populous of those tribes. It was huge. Ephraim was massive. It was big. And because Ephraim was so large, it took on the moniker of Israel. It was, it was Israel in the north, and one of its names is Ephraim, the tribe of Ephraim, fruitful. And so he goes up to Ephraim. He goes up to that area. And it's a historic area. Jacob did a lot of time up there. The 10 tribes went up there. We know that they, they destroyed the town, took it over. Remember when uh, uh, Levi and Simeon went in and, and circumcised everybody and then killed everybody that, in response to their, the, the uh, uh, taking of their sister. And so this, it, it was a big area. Also, when Joshua comes in, this is the area where Shechem is located between two big hills called Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal. And this is where the blessings and the cursings were spoken of. One mountain had the blessings spoken of, the cursings on the other. And it was almost like a second Sinai to the people of Israel inside the nation or inside the promised land. So it has some Big time historical significance already. And as we progress in our study, Shechem will come up over and over again as the central point, the capital of this new country that's starting up, which is called Israel. And of course, Judah will be in the south, these two kingdoms, the divided kingdom. So there's always been tension. You see this tension between Ephraim or Israel and Judah from Judges 8, Judges 12, 2 Samuel 2, 19 and 20. Constantly, it's alluded to in Jacob's prophecies of his sons. 
And so we believe that this is like an appeasement of him going up there to address these guys, to let them say, hey, you're still on the, you're still with us, okay? And we also know that Solomon used them a lot as laborers and people to serve him in the building of his of his temple, of the building complexes, of all the work that needed to be done in the kingdom, he relied upon those 10 tribes. Now in verse two, it says, so it happened when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, heard it, he was still in Egypt, for he fled from the presence of King Solomon, and he had been dwelling in Egypt, that Jeroboam, that they sent and called Jeroboam. Then Jeroboam and all the whole assembly of Israel came and spoke to Rehoboam, saying, so notice what they did. Israel wanted a spokesperson. Those 10 tribes of Israel got together and says, we need a guy to go in front and to talk to the king. Who do we want? So they got on their little ancient chariot email and they sent a message down to Jeroboam, who was in exile in Egypt, self-exile, and says, come up and be our spokesman with Rehoboam, the new king. And he did. Boy, he knew that was, he's like, oh, because he was holding on to that prophecy, that prophecy of Ahijah that said, hey, here's 10 pieces of cloth. This kingdom's going to be yours. I'm going to raise you up. So he knew it was going to be his. So he went and he dwelt there. And he came back as a spokesperson for the 10 tribes. What was, what was the speech? Verse 4. He says, this is what Jeroboam and the people of Israel said. Your father, it's talking to Rehoboam. Rehoboam, your dad made our yoke heavy. Now, therefore, lighten the burdensome service of your father and his heavy yoke, which he put on us, and we will serve you. So he just says, hey, we, just, we need relief. So he said to them, and, and so Rehoboam says back to them, well, hey, depart for three days, then come back to me in Shechem. And the people departed. I'll give me three days to think about it. They asked for a lighter burden of your father. Solomon had a heavy taxation, a heavy, uh, a heavy law on them because of all the building projects he has. He says, now, if you do lighten this burden, Jeroboam says, we'll serve you. We'll be, it will all be copacetic. We'll all be good. And he says, okay. But two things to note here in verse 4 and 5. Number one, guys, pay attention. Never expect a light burden from the world. Never expect that. You know, Jesus is the only one that we could look at for a light burden. They wanted that free... This. They wanted that burden to be light. It was too heavy. And so the, the world will never give that. Always know that. Look at what, remember what Jesus says in Matthew 11? In Matthew 11, verse 28, he says very plainly, it's a popular verse. Jesus says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and I'm lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. You know, service, and they said, oh, we'll serve you if you make it easy. We'll serve you if you make it easy. We serve Jesus not because it's easy, but because we love him. That's what makes service so sweet to the Lord. You know, if we come at Jesus and say, well, you know what? Your yoke is easy. Your burden is light. And that's why I'm going to serve you. Uh-uh. I serve the Lord because I love him. But the cool thing is when he comes and we surrender ourselves to Jesus, he yokes us up. He burdens us. And we are pleasantly surprised. It's light. It's easy. We can make it. You're like, well, I've had trials. I've had problems. I had tough times. With Jesus, even through the tough times, we can make it through. We've all been through tragedy. We've all been through burden sometimes. You might be going through one right now. But the Lord will see us through because he's made promises to us. He'll see us through. And it's because we love him and we trust him. He loves us. We love him. And so in verse 6, 
Look what it says. Then the king Rehoboam consulted the elders who stood before his father Solomon while he still lived. And he says, how do you advise me to answer these people? And they spoke to him. So these are the older guys that were hanging out with Solomon. And he says, if you will be a servant to these people today and serve them and answer them and speak good words to them, then they will be your servants forever. The elders' advice, these guys must have seen some stuff. These elders must have, guys, how cool would it be to be an elder in the courts of Solomon? Remember, in a couple of chapters past, we saw the Queen of Sheba, and what was her big thing that really blew her away? Was that your servants get to stand in your presence daily and hear your wisdom constantly. I'm just so, they're blessed constantly because they just get to be in the midst of your wisdom. And she saw the wonders of Solomon and she says, your servants are blessed to be here. I, t I tell Kelly that all the time at home. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Just kidding. She just looks at me and she's like, whatever. But <laughs> I'm going to get it when I get home. <laughs> but, you know, it, 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 husbands, try to do that with your wives. Just say, hey, hey, you're blessed to be here in, in this in this hand. <laughs> Just kidding. That's horrible. No. But the Queen of Sheba said that about Solomon. Your servants are so blessed to be here. Now, these are the servants. These are the elders. These are the guys, as she was saying, are so blessed. And these guys were dripping with the wisdom of Solomon. He, they were there when he was writing Proverbs. And they saw his, the testimony of Solomon, of a man who just compromised his life. He saw the, the failings of Solomon. They were there. They were close. They saw it. So when they came, and he says, what do you guys think I should do, Rehoboam is asking. They said three things. You need to be a servant unto them. Number one. And start now, today, right now. Be a servant to them. Secondly, answer them. When they call, answer them. Don't be an elite. Be down to earth. Be available to them. Answer their questions. Talk to them. Don't be an elite. And then secondly, speak good words to them. Be kind. Speak good words to them. You know what? Does this sound familiar? This is the Jesus way, man. What does Jesus say? Hey, be a servant to all. Just, you want, you want, hey, you want great things to happen? Serve. Serve the Lord, serve others. Answer them. Don't be an elite. Talk to them and speak good words to them. Let the words of your mouth praise the Lord and let the words of your mouth also, get this, guys, tell people about the gospel. That's the Jesus way. And so the elders were just saying, hey, it's, this, it's the Jesus way. It's what we need to do. And look at verse 8. Man, talk about a rejection. But he rejected the advice which the elders had given him. Notice that. He didn't even wait for the counsel of the younger. He's going to go to the, hear the young boys now. He didn't even wait. He says, ah, <laughs> no way. Oh, I don't even need that. That's, that's baloney. No way. That's thick cut baloney. No I'm not even gonna. I'm not even gonna deal with it, and that's the thing. But guys, how great it is that he just and so he just like whatever, and then he goes straight back to the young guys. But he rejected the advice which the elders had given him and consulted the young men. In the Hebrew, the word is yelad, which means the boys. It's the little boys. He talks to the little boys who had grown up with him and who stood before him. These are his. These are neighborhood kids. These are palace brats. And he says, let's talk to the palace brats. Boys, guys, what's up? Hey, what's up, kingy? You know, whatever, I don't know. And they come walking in. And he goes, what do you think I should say to these guys? And the boys grew up with them. Didn't even wait. Didn't even consider the other one. And in verse 9, and he said, what advice do you give? How should we answer this people who have spoken to me, saying, Lighten the yoke which your father has put on us. Then the young men who had grown up with him spoke to him, saying, Thus you should speak to the people who had spoken to you, saying, Your father made our yoke heavy, but you make it light upon us. But you 
make it lighter on us. Thus you shall say, my little finger shall be thicker than my father's waist. And now, whereas my father put a heavy yoke on you, I will add to your yoke my father's chastised you with whips, and I will chastise you with scourges. In the Hebrew, that word is scorpions. Crazy. What are they thinking? They said, we're, we're going to, he says, tell them that you're my pinky. My pinky. You thought, it says, my pinky will be as, it's going to be heavy. It's going to be like my father's waistline. It's like a dad bod right on you. Heavy. Push down. A heavy, my pinky's going to be heavy upon you. It's heavier. And then he goes, and my yoke is going to be heavier. I'm going to have, you think you're controlled by my dad. I'm going to have more control over you. I'm going to have a bigger yoke. Man, it's going to be, I'm going to control everything about your life. And he says, hey, and you thought he whipped, he whipped you to do work? <laughs> I'm going to whip you with scorpions. It's going to be more, it's going to be harsher, more pain-filled. This is the way of the world. Sin. This is what the world has to offer us. Complete opposite of Jesus. The elders had wisdom. That was wise. These young bucks, these young boys, these boys, the, the palace brats, what did they have? Absolute and complete foolishness. It doesn't even make sense, doesn't it? It's like, oh, what do I do? Hey, I think. Here you go, Mr. President. Here you go, Mr. King. I think that you should be meaner than your dad was. I think the way out of this is that you need to be raise taxes, control them more. Uh, oh, and be more severe, hurt them more. That's how you win over friends. What in the world? It doesn't even make sense. Well, what happens in verse 12? It's very clear what happens. So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam the third day as the king had directed, saying, come back to me the third day. Then the king answered the people roughly. And so it already started, roughly. And rejected the advice which the elders had given him. And he spoke to them according to the advice of the young men, saying, my father made your yoke heavy, but I will add to your yoke. My father chastened you with whips, but I will chasten you with scourges. So the king did not listen to the people. And now why? Why did he not listen? Why was all this foolishness happening? Here it is. For the turn of events was from the Lord, that he might fulfill his word, which the Lord had spoken by Ahijah the Shlomite to Jeroboam the son of Nebat. Rehoboam tells Israel after three days, this is how it's going to be. I'm going to be rough. The world does this. You know, it says, it, it says the word chastise you with scourges. The world brings that to us so often. The world wants to chastise us. But remember what it says? We just went through it for a whole week. Remember what it says in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5, that Jesus came for the chastisement of us? He took the whip for us. He took the chastisement for us. That's what Jesus came to do. The world wants to do that for us. Thank God we have a better king, amen, who comes and takes the whip of the world. Now notice this. I love this passage, and it brings such comfort to us. For the turn of events was from the Lord. See that in verse 15? For the turn of events was from the Lord. Why is this going on? What is going on? This, why are they saying this? Why are these guys saying these things? Why is he listening to them? What's going on? Have you ever watched the news and just said, what in the world is going on? <laughs> There's a lot of that going on right now. What in the world is going on? It might be an event in our world or in your personal life. And I like this passage because it brings comfort to me. For the turn of events, this crazy thing was from the Lord. God was doing something or allowing something so that his will, his perfect plan can come to pass 
in context, 10 tribes are going to go to Jeroboam. He promised that to Jeroboam. He said, because of Solomon's sin, you're going to get 10 tribes. And so all this craziness was from the Lord. Because he wanted to fulfill the promise that was given to him by a was given to Jeroboam by Ahijah. His pro, now get this about the Lord: His promises and His word will come to pass. It will happen. The Bible is true. He never forsakes us. Great is the faithfulness of God. So when we are experiencing chaos and turmoil cultural upheaval, government turmoil, injustice among us, God's doing something. God's doing something. We ask, where is God? And God's like, I'm in the big middle of it. He has not forsaken us. He is not distant. He hasn't walked away from the controls and we're on some runaway train. He is doing something. Now, what do we do? We're like, should we just accept it then? The chaos, the cultural upheaval, the craziness, the, the junk, the injustice, should we just accept it? Well, that's what the Lord wills. I've seen people like that. Well, this is God's will, so let's not do anything. Ooh, that's not us at all. We're called to stand on God's word, to say this is God's word. We're called to proclaim truth. We're called to proclaim the gospel. We're called to be a light. We're called to stand against injustice. We're called to stand against sin. Preach the gospel. Teach the word. Let the Lord be shining from us. But remember, this is not for us to freak out. During these days, don't panic. God's doing something. So you may freak out because of transsexualism. Don't freak out. This is just in times. God's doing something. I have never seen it this bad before. I know. I know. Well, I, what is, all this stuff is so bad. We've got to do something, Andrew. Let's do something. But always remember, God is doing something. Therefore, that causes us, don't freak out. Don't panic. We're losing our country. We might, but you know what? You know what? We're going to stand up. We're going to say the truth. We're going to proclaim the gospel. We're going to do all these things. We're going to be different from the world. We're going to stand out like a sore thumb in the midst of a culture that's totally corrupted. But yet, we're going to proclaim the love and the gospel and Jesus Christ. And he's the only way. All the stuff that's going on. From abortion to cultural junk to all these things. It is a, we are living in a day and age where we haven't seen for a, quite a long time in America where the church is going to be known by its differences with the world. We have gone through a time of compromise in our church, in, 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 the, in the church as a whole, the, church, the whole body of Christ. But we're, going to be, we're called to be different. We're not like the world. This is our guidepost. We go with love and truth. And that's where it's at. And man, I'll tell you, it's not going to look good to the world. They're not going to like us. But this is the thing. We should not freak out. Why? Because God's doing something. Of course, we stand against it. We proclaim truth. But yet, no, no. Hey, God is doing something really gnarly. And all these things are lining up for him to do some great stuff. I believe it goes right back to the rapture of the church. We are living in the last days. And I'm unapologetic about that. I am excited. I'm thrilled. But yet we still fight. We still preach. We still take a stand on all these things. And so for the turn of events was from the Lord. So next time you watch a news article or watch a news program or you see something online or something alerts on your phone of some crazy thing that's going on, whether it be in the world or in our country, just quote that out. You see it, it's like, something crazy is going on in, in Russia. For the turn of events was from the Lord. God's allowing it because he's doing something. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. He's doing something. Verse 16. Now, when all of Israel saw that the king did not listen to them, the people answered the king, saying, so this is Israel's response to Rehoboam's knuckleheadedness. What share have we in David? 
We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel. Now see to your own house, O David. He says, we're going to go over here to our own tents. You go over to your place, O David. You, you, you stay over there, O house of David. We're going to be over here mocking them, saying, we're done. We're walking. We're done. So Israel departed from their tents, uh, departed to their tents. But Rehoboam reigned over the children of Israel who dwelt in the cities of Judah. So he, he still was there. He was still reigning, but they left. Then, you know, you think, oh, how worse, how more worse can this get? You know, Rehoboam, you know, the foolishness must stop now, right? No, it gets worse. He has this crazy scheme. He's actually going to put into practice the whole pinky thing, the whole yoke thing. He's going to say, let's do it. So poor guy, this poor guy, King Rehoboam sent Adoram, who was in charge of the revenue. He's the IRS guy. He's the tax man. He sends him out to the ten tribes. But all of Israel stoned him with stones, and he died. Now, don't get any ideas coming up April 15th. Don't get any ideas. Love one another, even them. And he died. Therefore, King Rehoboam mounted his chariot in haste to flee to Jerusalem. So he's still up there. He's still up in Shechem. So he heads back to Jerusalem in haste. So Israel has been in rebellion against the house of David to this day. So this is written while they were still in rebellion. Now, so, uh, and now it came to pass when Israel, all of Israel heard that Jeroboam had come back, they sent for him and called him to the congregation and made him king over all of Israel. And there was none who followed the house of David, but the tribe of Judah only. So Judah says, oh, you'll be our king. And, and that's it. And so... It just happens. And it says they haven't had unity until this day. They got together. We know they came back together during the days of the Maccabees. Uh, they came together. They united as a country again during the days of the Maccabees. They were then split up again because of a minor civil war that happened, which resulted in Rome taking over. And the next time that they came back together was in 1948, uh, which, the, which we have today, the nation of Israel. And they came back and they're united today. And of course, we know that they'll be united again in the millennial kingdom. So, what happens? Look at verse 21. Now, when Rehoboam came to Jerusalem, he assembled all the house of Judah with the tribe of Benjamin, 180,000 chariots, uh, chosen men who were warriors to fight against the house of Israel, that he might restore the kingdom of Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. But the word, so he gets an army together, huge army, the big Judah army comes together. But the word of God came to Shimei, the man of God, saying, so God, he speaks through one of his prophets. And this is what God says to Judah. Speak to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, king of Judah, and to all the house of Judah and Benjamin, and to the rest of the people, saying, so now remember, just a couple of logistic things. The tribe of the tribes, the ten tribes that were up in the north, uh, we see them as Ephraim, Manasseh, Reuben, Dan, Issachar, Naphtali, Asher, Zebulun, Gad, and Simeon. Those are the ten tribes in the north. In the south, it's only called Judah. But we know that Benjamin is connected with Judah. All right? Because that's, they, it, they're considered one. So it's Judah and Benjamin. There is also the tribe of Levi. Now remember, they didn't have territory. They had cities. There were Levites that were in the north, and there were Levites in the south in Judah. But also, we know that Simeon, according to what it says in, in Chronicles and also in other places that we've just studied, that Simeon had kind of dissolved into Judah. Simeon was in the middle of Judah, and Simeon had dissolved into Judah. So Really, if you want to get down to it, some people believe that there was just nine tribes. But we know that God says in the scripture there's ten. Simeon is thrown in there. Some people believe that. And the ten tribes are never really stated. They're, they're, some people believe it's Levi that's the tenth tribe, or Simeon is there. Or sometimes they believe that, Joseph, that Ephraim and Manasseh join up as the tribe of Joseph, which then brings in Simeon and Levi, and then it's just Judah and Benjamin in the south. 
Uh, we're, we're just unclear on that. But we know that those, those tribes are there. Uh, some people believe that Simeon and Levi, especially Simeon, was like, kind of like uh, during the Civil War, Missouri, Kentucky, and uh, were border states, remember? And West Virginia, those were border states. And so they were on the, the they were, half of them were in the north, half of them were in the south. Simeon was kind of like that. Um, and we see them pop up a couple times, so they weren't totally dissolved. They were still their own people. But they were there. And so he just says here, he goes in verse uh, 24, where are we at? 21? And, uh, oh, verse uh, 22. So he says, speak to Judah and Benjamin. So this is just for the south. And in verse 24, here it comes what the Lord says. Thus says the Lord, you shall not go up nor fight against your brethren, the children of Israel. Let every man return to his house, for this is from me. Therefore, they obeyed the word of the Lord. Thank God they obeyed and turned back according to the word of the Lord. So they didn't go and fight. They didn't have a hot civil war. They just left them. But they said, this thing is from me, like we've talked about already. And so in verse 25, what are they doing? Jeroboam's in the north. Rehoboam's in the south. Then Jeroboam built Shechem in the mountains of Ephraim and dwelt there. Also, he went out from there and built Penuel, which is south of them as a defensive city. And Jeroboam said to his, in his heart, so he's thinking in his heart. He's just thinking to himself. He says, now the kingdom may return to the house of David if these people go up and offer sacrifices in the house of the Lord of Jerusalem, then the heart of this people will turn back to their Lord, Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they will kill me and go back to Rehoboam, king of Judah. Jeroboam was saying in his heart, he was inquiring in his heart, be careful, saints, when you do that. Sometimes you just think too much. I do it so much. Kelly knows this about me. That I just, something will occur and I'll start thinking of five scenarios to 50,000 scenarios on how this could go bad. Have you ever done that before? Or am I the only one? Or you just sit there and go, okay, this is a bad thing that's going on. This is how, and then we work out this whole scenario. Tonight, Jacob had a malfunction with his retainer braces thing that they put in his mouth. The wire came out, so he can't talk, which is hilarious. <laughs> and so he's talking like this, and he can't move. It's, just, it's rubbing up against his tongue, and it's just tripping him out. So we're going to go get it fixed tomorrow. I don't know if we should, but we are. <laughs> and, uh, and so Jacob's there, and, I, and I, he, I'm studying. He comes in, and he goes, I can't. And he's like, hey, it's bothering me, Dad. And I'm like, I'm so, I started laughing. And he goes, and then I, and then he's just like, man, it's, it's, it's there. It's loose. And I just, you know me. I said, well, hopefully it doesn't fall off and you swallow it while you sleep in the middle of the night. <laughs> or it goes in your airway. Oh. And you can see this kid. I just ruined him. He goes. <laughs> and he, you know he didn't think about that. He's like, oh. And then he just walks out of my office. I'm like, Jacob, I'm just joking. He goes. I said, are you scared? He goes, uh-huh, uh-huh. And I'm just like, oh, man, I'm sorry, Jacob, but you know, it, it won't fall off. It's secure on the other side. You're fine. So pray for him that it doesn't. But it just, and I'm just like, I was like, maybe we get some pliers and just go whack, you know, and pull it out. I'm afraid of more pull us too. You know, and, and it's kind of like that, though, you know? Have you ever done that before? It's like, oh, this is, this is what's going to happen, and this is how bad it's going to be. And then you think, oh, no, no, it's going to get, this is how bad it's going to be. And this is, no, no, this is how bad it's going to be. And we just kind of build up. Jeroboam is doing that right now. He's all like, he's thinking in his heart. I'll tell you, be careful, saints. That's when you need to start praying. How bad can this go? Well, that's when you start to pray. When your mind begins to wander on how bad and how, you know, horrible this situation can go down, that's when you take all those thoughts and you take them to the cross and you go to prayer. Remember that old hymn, Sweet Hour of Prayer? And that one line that says, Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. How true is that? I'll tell you how many times have we suffered restless nights because we refused to take it to God in prayer. 
praying and asking God and just pouring out our hearts to God. And things get worse and worse. And when we, but, but, hey, it's like, oh, things are getting worse in my heart. But uh, Lord, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cast the cares of my heart to you right now in prayer. His worry was he didn't want to be killed. That's where his mind went. He wanted, and, and this is the thing. He says, I know I need to change their hearts to keep them with me. Hmm. You know, the enemy knows that. He was worried about their hearts being swayed. Every year you had three pilgrim festivals up to Jerusalem. And every Jew was commanded by the law to go once every three, once one of those three feasts, or all of them, to go up to Jerusalem, present yourself before the Lord at Passover, Shavuot, or Sukkot. And it was three times of the year. You would go up, and if it was Shavuot, it was a great time of getting a tent and being outside. Tremendous joy. The rabbi said that no one knows true joy until you experience inside of the sukkah. They loved that one. That was in the fall. Then you had Passover. That was in the spring. The Passover lamb. Remember what Jesus did, or what, the, what God did and by the blood of the Passover lamb being put on the doorpost and setting the people free and the freedom from Egypt. Then you had Shavuot. Shavuot was a harvest festival where they would remember the giving of the law. And they would praise the Lord for the giving of the law. And it was just a sweet time. Three great festivals that, you would, that God told you, pick one and go up. And so he thought, when the people of Israel leave Israel and travel all the way down to Jerusalem and they ascend up and they worship the Lord and they're clapping, singing the songs of ascent and they go up to that glorious temple of Solomon and they hear the choir and they hear the singing and they hear the wonderfulness and they smell the offering and the incense and the worship and the, and the giving of the Lord and they see old friends and they're like, oh, I haven't seen you since the split. Oh, that he just started to think, oh, they're going to, their hearts are going to be swayed. And he, was, and he was right, probably. There's a tremendous joy in the house of the Lord. And Jeroboam's like going, how can I get them out of that house? And he says, I'm gonna, I, I got away. He needed to get their hearts. The enemy knows that he, if he could get our hearts, he wins. He'll own us. And so in verse 28, what does he do? Therefore the king asked advice and made two golden calves and said to the people, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Here are your gods, O Israel, what brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And he sent one in Bethel and the other one he put in Dan. Now this thing became a sin for the people of Israel to worship before the one as far as Dan. And he made shrines on the high places, and he made priests from every class of people who were not of the sons of Levi. Jeroboam ordained a feast on the 15th day of the eighth month, like the feast that was in Judah, and offered sacrifices on the altar. So he did at Bethel, sacrificing to the calves that he had made, and at Bethel he installed the priests of the high places which he had made. So he made offerings on the altars which he had made at Bethel on the 15th day of the eighth month in the month which he had devised um, in his own heart that he ordained a feast for the children of Israel and offered sacrifices on the altars and burned incense. So here's Jeroboam's new religion. It's the religion of Israel. It's going to become their national religion. And it's not new. It's just a recycled one from the days of Exodus. Remember that story when Moses went up to the Mount of Sinai to receive the law, all the law. He was there for, gone for 40 days. And while they were gone, they said, ah, he's dead. Let's make a God. And they convinced Aaron to fashion and mold a, 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 a golden calf. And they worshiped the golden calf. And then then Moses came down. Charlton Heston with, 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 and he came down. He says, Thus, if you're with the Lord, come on this side. If you're not, stay over there. And, he, and it says that he, and remember, he doesn't throw it at the calf. It's not the movie. But he takes the things and he breaks them on the ground, grinds up the Ten Commandments, mixes it with water, and forces the wicked to drink it and the bitterness. 
and he judges and, he, and he, they take out, he makes the people go and get the people who are worshiping the false god and he takes them out and kills them all for idolatry. Those people who were doing it. And the golden calf was gone. And they crush it, they break it up. So what does Jeroboam do? He goes, hey guys, I got something better. I got something old school for you. I got something old school. Something, back back our, our forefathers used to do this. Uh, calf worship. And these are the gods that brought us out. Even, they even said it. And we just don't have one. We have two. Better. And we're going to bring, not just one god, we have two. Two. They're golden. We got two. And, oh, oh, not just one place of worship. <laughs> How boring. He even says it. He even says it right there. Look what he says. He goes, he goes, it's too much for you. <gasps> you got to walk all the way from the north, all the way down. And then not just down. You got to go up to Jerusalem. That's a long haul. You got to go from the Galilee, which is 500 feet below sea level, to 3,000 feet, 4,000 feet above sea level. That's too much for you, Israel. That's too much. That's a lot of miles on the, on the donkey. I don't know if he can make it. So that's too much. I want to help you. Help me help you. Help me help you. We're going to do not just one God. We're going to do two gods. And we're not going to just do one place of worship. We're going to have two places of worship. You don't have to go all the way up to Jerusalem. We're going to have one in Bethel. It's closer. It's closer. And it's flatter. It's rolling hills. It's not mountains. It's rolling. Oh, there. We're, we're just there. It's convenient. And if you're way up in the north, you don't even have to come to Bethel. We got one up in Dan. Dan's up. Dan's right at the foot of the mountain right there. Just, and it's beautiful. It's got this bub, babbling brook that comes down. And it's coming right out of the mountain there. It's just gorgeous. It's gorgeous. Hey, if you want to go up there, you can go up there. Either one. Convenient. It's convenient. Oh, and not just that. It says in verse uh, 31 that he made shrines. That word is that he made little houses of worship. Little houses of worship. You, you know, and in between, that whole city of Levite thing, and we're going to put smaller little houses of worship closer to you. So you could just worship there. Burn incense. And, offer. and not just that, these houses of worship, these new houses of worship to these golden calves are going to be right next to the pagan ones. We're going to be interdenominational. We're at, they're at the high places. So, you, yeah, okay, you got Baal and Ashtoreth and, and Molech going on over there, but we're going to have ours. We're just part of the, this is a, it's going to be a, a, a convenient cultural thing. So we're, we're all together on this. Oh, the, the priests, we're going to get rid of the Levites. We don't need the Levites. Anybody can be a priest. Anybody can be a priest. It's not about what the Bible says a priest is. If you want to be a priest, you can be a priest. Come on in. Oh, we're going to have our own feasts. You don't have to do three. We're just going to do one and done. One and done. We're going to do it on the eighth month, on the 15th day of the eighth month. You're like, well, what is that? Nothing. It's a gap in the festival Jewish year. It's after the festival of tabernacles. It's during olive season. The real busy time is wheat gathering. That's hard, intensive labor. Let's just get your job done. And this is the convenient time. It's olive picking season. They just fall off the trees. We're good. This is that was easy. You gather the olives, and yeah, that's, a, that's a low intensity. You don't have to grind, and the grinding is done by animals. It's all good. This is a simple one, and it's easy. It's just one. It's not multiple grains. Just one fruit, olives. It's all the season. It's a better time. It's a more convenient time for you. And we'll keep all the offerings, the sacrifices, the incense. It will smell and do the same thing. It's just, it's just better. It's just better. And this became a sin to them. It was a convenient religion for them. It, there is, listen, guys, there's God's way to worship, period. 
It's what the Bible says. It's laid out in God's word is the only way. Remember Nadab and Abihu back in the day in the, the first day, day number one of the tabernacle. Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, brought strange fire into the tabernacle. They were the first ones, and they said, oh, we'll just bring this in. We'll just add it in. And what did God do with Nadab and Abihu? He cooked them. He literally, fire shot out from the tabernacle and said, no, and killed them right there. And everybody knew why, because it was, he, they were publicly doing something their own way. And God said, no, you do it my way. Uh, we are in a time in our society where we do not hold God's word dear. And this is why we at Calvary Chapel Long Beach hold on to God's word. We do it his way. We don't compromise. We don't, we don't mix with the things of this world. But it's convenient. But it's cultural. But it's cutting edge. But it's not Christ. That's the deal. It has to be Christ. And if it's not Christ, then it'll be, cult, then it'll be totally carnal and compromised. It just will in God's eyes. I don't want to be carnal. I came out of that world, man. I don't want to be compromised. I'm sick of it. I want to be what I want to be Christ. I want to be what he wants. If we settle for convenient, cultural and cutting edge, guys, it will just lead to carnality and compromise. It just will. That's why we have to stay with Christ. And so they took the the, the, the it's just convenient. Listen. There's a lot of churches that will do that. There's a lot of, uh, Wimber, not Wimber. What's the guy's name? Over at Willow Creek. He was the guy that invented it in America. A convenient, user-friendly. Bill Heib or, yeah, Heibels was his last name. He just wanted, hey, I, I remember his famous quote, I have people in this church that don't even know it's church. <laughs> Jeez, Louise, he ran it like a show. Sometimes I ask Tyler when he's going to get his smoke machine. You know, no, I'm just joking. <laughs> just kidding. I, listen, it's not about style and looks. I don't care about that. But it's, it's, the, it's the issues. It's the word. It's the prayer. Hey, listen, if we, it, listen it, it's not about convenience. We don't compromise things in God's word. We don't compromise things having to do with the nature of God. We don't compromise those things. That's where it's at. It's not about convenience. It's not about, oh, well, just, it's easier for me. You know, sometimes we complain. We all complain. Everybody does. We complain about, you know, well, but this and that, this. And some people complain about church, about fellowship, about little things in the Bible, and in the Bible studies or in their, in their, in their worship ceremony, in the service. And, then you, and when I start to complain about things, I just start thinking of persecuted Christians. I think of Christians in, in, in the Middle East who might get their head chopped off tomorrow. And there are Christians in China or Southeast Asia that are just totally in hiding. I think of Christians in North Korea. I think of the Christians in North Korea that are in the little, in those, in those Korean gulags there that just don't, that, that are totally isolated, but they know Jesus. And, and they just know God, and they're, they're there because they're Christians. And, no, and, and the whole world's forgotten about them except for the Lord. And then I think about, I'm complaining because it's cold in the sanctuary or because it's hot in the sanctuary. And I complain about it. You're like, oh, are, you, are you saying I'm No, no, I complain about it. Your pastor complains about it. I complain about so many different things. But guys, let's just, hey, listen. Let's not look for convenience. American Christianity is so just convenient. Listen, I just want to go to a church. I just want to go to a place that teaches God's word. And I will be very honest with you. If we ever stop, if we ever start compromising God's word at this place, leave. Run away. Ditch me. Find another pastor as quick as you possibly can. We will never compromise God's word. We're not in it for the convenience. We're in it for the, just the wonderful transformation that the word of God gives us. The Holy Spirit, the blood of Jesus, the gospel message. That's where it's at. So this is the beginning. And that stole their hearts and they never went back to Jerusalem. Now begins 
what is the crazy part of kings? The, the, the two countries. And people get confused. People say, oh, it, I don't know who's who. We will make it easy for you. There is no, there, guys, there is no such thing as a hard part in the Bible. Guys, we're going to break it down. We're going to have charts. You're going to follow right along. And it will bounce back and forth. It's, it, follow the bouncing biblical ball, okay? It'll go, Judah, 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 Israel, 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 Judah, 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 Judah. And it will just go through back and forth. And you're like, who's who? We will make it clear. And we'll, we'll start, go through your scriptures, look at the kings, and start writing down on, at the, that word changes, J for Judah, I for Israel. Do it in a red ink or in a blue ink. And you're like, what if I mess up? White out. <laughs> okay? And you can do it. It's very easy. We'll have all that broken down. But guys, get into God's word. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we just thank you so much for your word. Lord, help us never compromise. Never let us look for the convenience. We ask that you would just strengthen us by your spirit. That the things that we have learned, the things that we live in, the, in this life as Christians, it would not be a thing of the flesh, but it would be a thing of the spirit. Keep our hearts committed to you in all things. We love you, Lord. Let us walk in wisdom and not in foolishness. We love you, Jesus, in your holy name. Amen. In my life, Lord, be glorified, be glorified. In my life, Lord, be glorified today. I love you guys. Have a good night.